The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning. This is Neil Polymus. I'd like to welcome everybody to our first uh, spring webinar. The topic today is distribution fitting for arbitrarily censored data. Censored data arise when the value of an observation is only partially known. Now that occurs in several different uh, sorts of instances. Uh, first, we might have a medical trial. And in a medical trial, the survival time of a patient may only be known to be greater than some value because the patient left the study. Um, it's important when you're dealing with that type of data that you don't just throw away uh, information because someone in medical trial who leaves the study after a certain point in time, um, we do know something about. We know that the survival of that particular person was at least equal to the length of time at which they left the study. So we don't want to throw it away. Um, if we are in the process of fitting distributions to determine means and standard deviations, percentiles, and so forth, we want to take into account um, all the observations, wh whether they be censored or not. Uh, a second example uh, might arise in environmental statistics. For example, we might uh, take a measurement to study groundwater contamination, but only know that the amount of contaminant in this uh, particular sample is less than some detection or quantitation limit. And I'll be looking at some examples of fitting these types of data, both medical data and environmental data, today, so you can see what Stat Graphics has to offer uh, when all of our data are not completely known. Now, as um, today, we're actually going to consider three types of censored data. One type of data that arises fairly frequently in medical trials is right censored data. That's uh, a situation where we don't know exactly what a, an observation is. We only know that it's greater than some particular value. So if a, a patient leaves a medical trial, we'll know that the survival time is at least equal to the last time uh, they participated, uh, the time they left, but we won't know exactly what the survival time might be. We also need to deal uh, often with left censored data. And in environmental statistics, uh, where you're dealing with quantitation limits and detection limits and so forth, it's very common to have left censored data. In the case of left censored data, you know simply that a particular observation is less than some value. There's also interval censored data. It doesn't arise as frequently, but it does arise sometimes, where we'll know not exactly what a particular observation is, but simply know that it's between two limits. For example, we might know that it's between 6 and 10, but not know exactly what, what the observation is. Now, I have two examples that I want to talk about, and I will invite you, as I always do in these webinars, as we go along, if you do have particular questions that you'd like to send to us, please use the facilities of GoToWebinar to send that. And after about 45 minutes to an hour, however long I, I end up talking, I'll take a look at what questions were sent, and uh, we'll go back and look at it. Okay, now, I brought along two examples. The first example has to do with arsenic concentrations. It turns out that uh, 24 samples were taken and reported by Tomlinson back in 2003, measuring the arsenic concentrations in an urban stream in Oahu, Hawaii. You see here the 24 measurements. Some of the measurements are completely known. 
for example, if it says 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, those are exact values. There's no uncertainty in that particular measurement uh, other than natural measurement error. Where you see a notation like less than 0 0.9, for an observation like that, we simply know that the amount of arsenic in that particular sample was less than 0.9 but because of reporting limits, detection limits, or, or whatever, uh, we can't say exactly what the amount was. So if you take a look at this uh, sample of 24 observations, you'll see that some of the values are known completely. Some of the values are left censored. And in this particular example, there were a number of different reporting limits. You can see that in some cases it was known that a sample was 0 0.5. In other cases, it's simply labeled as less than 0.9, less than 1, less than 2, which may have had to do with the method in which those measurements were taken, that they didn't feel they could quantify exactly what the measurement was if it was below a particular limit. Okay, so we'll be looking at a moment for this particular data which has exact values and some left censored observations. The second example I'd like to talk about um, has to do with a breast cancer study. It was reported by Finkelstein and Wolf back in 1985. What they were looking at was patients with breast cancer that were given two different treatments. Some were given radiation and um, some were given radiation followed by chemotherapy. What they were measuring was the days between when the treatment was given and when they first detected breast retraction. So where you see the column labeled days, um, that, that's the actual data that we want to analyze. Now the way this data arose was a patient was given a treatment and then came back several times for follow-up studies. For example, they may have come back after seven days and again after 15 days, again after 24 days. Okay? Some of the data in this case are left censored. For example, if you look at uh, patient number three, the measurement says less than seven. That's because that patient returned after seven days and already had retraction. So the occurrence of retraction occurred for patient three in less than seven days. Patient two, on the other hand, uh, is a case of interval censored data. They came for their first follow-up visit after six days, did not have retraction, came again after 10 days and did have retraction. So the data for patient two is interval censored. All we know is that retract the time to retraction is somewhere between 6 and 10. And then you have patients like patient 1, whose last visit was 45 days after treatment, and at that point there was still no retraction. So if retraction was to occur, it was going to occur at more than 45 days. It's an interesting sample because we have a combination of left-censored, right-censored, and interval-censored data. Okay, so we're going to uh, see what stack graphics can do for these types of data. Now, there are basically two procedures in stack graphics which are designed to fit distributions to censored data. The first is on the describe menu under distribution fitting, and it's labeled fitting censored data. Now, this particular procedure has been around for many years. Um, probably at least 10 years from a fairly early version of the program. It's designed to fit any of 27 different probability distributions to data consisting of either left-censored, right-censored, or a combination of left and right-censored data. It'll determine mean standard deviations, percentiles, and so forth, for data with both left and right censoring. It does not, on the other hand, handle interval censored data. 
This procedure, though, does include some goodness of fit tests. Those are tests that can help us determine whether a particular distribution is adequate for a sample of data. Okay. Now, those of you who are using older versions, uh, versions before Stack Graphics 18, have access to that particular procedure. In version 18, we added a second procedure for fitting distributions to sensor data. This procedure handles left-centered, right-centered, and interval-centered data, any combination of those, which is why I call it arbitrarily censored data. Now, this involves the new interface with R. For that particular procedure, although stack graphics will actually fit the distributions, we rely on an R package to do the non-parametric estimates of the survival function. Now, the one drawback about that particular procedure is, it, is that it does not include goodness of fit tests. Uh, basically, interval uh, sensor data is quite difficult to handle in terms of determining whether a particular distribution is appropriate or not. We do have some graphical techniques, which I'll show you, that will tell us whether or not a particular distribution appears to be reasonable for the data, but there's no formal test with a p-value or anything like that from that particular procedure. Okay, well, let's start with the arsenic data. And um, as always, I will provide this data at the end of the webinar. We'll post it on our website. So those of you who want to try um, with the data can, um, can, tr can try it out. Now, it's in a file, the arsenic data, called arsenicconcentrations.sgd. And when I go to Stack Graphics in just a moment and look at this data file, you'll see that there are, the data has actually been entered in two different ways. There is a column in the file called arsenic concentration. That is a censored numeric column, a special column type that we introduced in version 18 so that we could enter directly censored values. So for example, you can see in that particular column, uh, patient seven, the data for patient seven is shown as less than 0.9. Earlier versions of stack graphics uh, would have had to treat that as a character column, but in version 18, that is a special censored numeric column. Now, the new procedures, uh, for example, the interface to R distribution fitting procedure can take that particular column type directly and will interpret uh, the data as either being an exact value or a censored value, depending upon how it's been entered. The earlier procedures, and for those of you who work um, in versions before version 18, you would have had to have entered the data as two separate columns. You would have created a column called value in which you put the numeric value, either the exact measurement if you had it, or the reporting limit if in fact it was censored data. You would then have created a second column called censored, where you'd enter either a zero, a minus one, or a plus one. In a censored column, zero would indicate that the associated numeric value in the value column was not censored. Minus one would indicate left censoring, that the value was actually less than 0.9. And if I had right censored observations, which I don't, I would have put a plus one, a plus one indicating that the actual value is greater than indicated by uh, the value column. Okay, I'll also note that there is another menu option that's been added to version 18 under edit replace censored values that'll actually let you take a numeric 
the center numeric column and create the value column. Okay, well, let's get into it. Let me switch over now, if I can, to Stack Graphics. Uh, this is version 18 of Stack Graphics, and you'll see that I've loaded up this particular set of data. Now, what I was just uh, mentioning before, you can see if I double click, for example, on arsenic concentration, that it is a censored numeric column. Okay. If I were to click on it, go to edit, and select replace censored values, you'll see a dialog box that you could use to create the value column out of the arsenic concentration column. The option edit replace censored values lets you take each of the censored indicators, in this case less than 0.9, less than one, less than two, and specify a replacement value for it. That's how I actually created that value column after I typed in the arsenic concentrations. That's just an aside um, that I thought I would show you. Now, the first thing I'd like to do with this particular data is to get an idea about what might be a reasonable distribution to fit. And a good place to start is to go to describe distribution fitting probability plots. Now, the probability plots procedure will take data and create probability plots for several different distributions. I'm going to take, in this case, the value column and put it in where it says data. And then where it says select, I'll type in censored equals zero. That will tell it to take only the uncensored observations. All right, so let's press OK. Now, if I happen to have some left censored observations, which were all less than the smallest uncensored observation, or right censored observations greater than the largest uncensored observations, I could tell it how many were below the minimum and how many were above the maximum. Okay, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to go ahead and ask it to calculate for me the seven probability plots. There they are. Now, what a probability plot does is it basically takes the data and you can see here the uncensored observations in, uh, of arsenic concentration and plot it on a scale such that if a particular distribution were appropriate for the data, the points would lie close to a diagonal line. Okay, now you can see in this case for the uniform distribution, the points clearly don't fall along a diagonal line. They're, they're, they're fairly uh, curved. So uniform distribution, clearly not very good for this particular data. Um, here's the normal probability plot. Normal distribution a little bit better than the uniform distribution, but there's still a, a fair amount of curvature here. Um, also, a normal distribution is not particularly good for handling data that can't be negative. You know, you've, things like survival times or arsenic concentrations have a lower bound of zero. And if you fit a normal distribution, there's certainly nothing to ensure that the normal distribution won't go below zero. So I don't think I want that one. Um, this one's considerably better. Uh, here is a probability plot for the log normal distribution. The log normal distribution has a minimum of zero, which is a nice uh, property if you're dealing with this type of data. You can also see, although it's not perfect, the points are much closer to the diagonal line than for the normal probability plot. Okay. We can look at some others. Um, there's the Weibull plot. That's got some curvature. There's the extreme value plot, not very good. 
a logistic probability plot, not that great. Uh, this one, though, not too bad, the exponential probability plot. So of the of the two choices, I think probably the exponential and the log normal distribution are the most appropriate. I would tend to go probably with a log normal distribution. It has two parameters as opposed to only a single parameter for the exponential distribution. Also, it has the very nice property that if your data follow a log normal distribution, the logs of your data follow a normal distribution. And that's a pretty nice property if you want to use other statistical procedures that, that rely on normality. Okay. So it looks like the log normal distribution is at least a reasonable model to start with for the uncensored values in this particular uh, data set. However, when we fit the log normal distribution now, we want to fit it not just to the uncensored values, but to all of the values, the censored values as well as the uncensored values. Now, to do that, I'm going to start by going to describe distribution fitting, fitting censored data. Now, this is the procedure that's been around in stack graphics for quite a while. So if you're still using version 17 or even version 16, uh, this procedure has not changed. You'll be able to do this. This is the one that's designed to handle left censored data or right censored data. Now, since it's an older procedure, I won't be able to use the censored numeric uh, column. Instead, I'll need to pick the value column and then add in the censored column where it asks for the censoring indicators. That censored column is the one that has the minus ones and zeros to tell it which values were left censored. All right. Now, we have a choice of quite a number of different distributions that we can fit to this particular data. This is why I went to the probability plot first to get an idea of what might be a reasonable model to fit to the data. And I'm going to ask it in this case to go ahead for me and fit a log normal distribution. It's going to list for me a number of tables and graphs that it can calculate. I think I'll ask for an analysis summary a goodness of fit test to tell us whether or not the log normal distribution is actually a reasonable candidate for this particular data set. I'm also going to ask for a comparison of alternative distributions. What that's going to do is that's going to take a handful of distributions that are good for censored data, fit them, and sort them according to some goodness of fit statistic. Okay, so it'll tell us whether one of the distributions um, that it considers might do better than the log normal. I'm also going to ask for the frequency histogram, the quantile plot, and the quantile quantile plot. Okay, well, let's go on ahead and take in now the arsenic concentrations and fit a distribution to it. Okay, you can see up here actually the fitted distribution, the fitted log normal distribution. Um, now, I don't expect a particularly close fit to the histogram, of course, because some of the data were censored. There were quite a few that were less than two, for example. They're shown in this particular bar. So the fact that the log normal distribution doesn't necessarily match the histogram uh, doesn't worry me when I'm dealing with a lot of censored data. You can see, though, the log normal distribution has a fairly nice property. It rises from zero to a peak at a concentration of about 0 0.5, 0 0.6, something like that, and then falls off with a, a rather long tail to the upper side. Okay. If I go back to the analysis summary and look at a summary of this particular distribution, 
there were a total of 24 values for arsenic concentration. They ranged between 0.5 and 3.2. 13 of the 24 observations were left censored. There were no right censored observations. Now, the fitted log normal distribution we just looked at has a mean of 0 0.945 and a standard deviation of 0.656. Okay, those are the two parameters uh, of the distribution. And, and incidentally, the distribution was estimated by maximum likelihood. It's a numerical fit when you have censored data. Um, to determine what the optimal parameters of that distribution are. It also shows you, incidentally, what the mean and standard deviation of the log concentration is. I noted before that if the data follow a log normal distribution, the logs of the data are normally distributed. So it's giving you the equivalent mean and standard deviation in the log scale. All right. Now, that is taking account of the censoring. This is not the result you would have gotten if you just fit a distribution to the value column. It's taking account of the fact that there were, in fact, left censored observations. Now, to see if the log normal distribution is reasonable or not, I'm going to go to the second pane here, the goodness of fit tests. Now, let me go back to PowerPoint for just a moment, if I can, and tell you just a little bit about the goodness of fit tests in the case of censored data. Incidentally, I will be posting these slides on the website also when the webinar is finished, uh, so you can go back and see the different sequence of screens um, <clears throat> that I went through. However, there were certain things about the goodness of fit tests that I really wanted to mention, so I thought I'd go back to this particular PowerPoint slide. Now, <clears throat> goodness of fit tests are tests that tell us whether or not the fitted distribution corresponds closely enough to the observed observations. In the case of uncensored data, Stack Graphics will do a number of different types of goodness of fit tests. It'll do chi-square tests, Kolmogorov smirnoff tests, Cooper tests, Kramer von Mises, Watson, Anderson Darling uh, tests, and so forth. Not all of these tests can be used if you have censored data. And in fact, you can see here, this is the dialog box I'd get if I right-clicked and went to paint options for the arsenic data. Uh, procedures, tests like the Anderson-Darling tests, cannot be used when you have multiple reporting limits, uh, data that's censored at more than one value. If, in fact, all of the censoring data was at a low level, let's say, it was, we had only a single reporting limit, uh, 0.5, for example, and I had a lot of less than 0.5s in the data. Uh, I could have used an Anderson-Darling test. It could be modified to handle that kind of data. But when you have multiple reporting limits, I had less than 0.9, some were less than 1, some were less than 2. We can't do anything with the Anderson-Darling test. Um, however, the kolmogorov smirnoff test, it turns out, can be modified to handle that particular type of data. It involves using the Kaplan-Meier positions on the probability plots, uh, details of which I don't want to get into. But it can be modified to handle multiple reporting limits. Now, you'll also notice if you look at the pane options dialog box that you get for the arsenic data, that there is a, the ability to tell it if you have some special types of censoring in your data. Uh, <clears throat> some data is said to have type 1 censoring. Type 1 censoring occurs 
if items or subjects or patients are removed after some pre-specified time. So I might say, I'm going to observe my subjects for the next 12 months, and then I'll stop the test after 12 months. That would be called type one censoring. Type two censoring is a test that stopped after some pre-specified number of failures. Perhaps I'm looking at the reliability of a manufactured product and I, I start testing lots of light bulbs or whatever. And I decide to stop the, my test after 80% of the light bulbs have failed. That would be called type 2 censoring. Well, it turns out that there are special modifications you can do for tests like the Anderson-Darling test if you have type 1 or type 2 censoring. Now, this data is not censored in either one of those ways. And in particular, there's more than one reporting limit. So really, the only goodness of fit tests we could look at were the Kolmogorov-Smirnov and the Cooper tests. Okay, I decided to look um, at the Kolmogorov-Smirnov test. That's the best known of the tests. And the way the goodness of fit test works, if the p-value for the test is bigger than 0.05, then I cannot reject the distribution I've picked at the 5% significance level. So because the p-value is 0.09, which is bigger than 0.05, I would not reject the idea that the log normal distribution is appropriate for this data. Now, it doesn't prove that it's the best distribution, but at least it says that the distribution seems to fit reasonably well to this particular data. Okay, now let's go back uh, again to stack graphics. Uh, there you can see the results of the Kolmogorov Smirnov test. Um, log normal distribution appears to be a reasonable candidate. Is it the best though? Well, I don't know, but I did also ask for a comparison of alternative distributions. On this particular pane, the procedure will fit a number of different probability distributions to the data. And it will sort them according to a particular statistic. Right, right now, it's sorting them according to the log likelihood. I'd prefer and I'll go to pane options to not worry about the likelihood, but sort it according to the Kolmogorov-Smirnov statistic. And now you can see the distribution sorted according to the Kolmogorov-Smirnov D statistic. The D statistic, incidentally, is the maximum difference between the fitted cumulative distribution, whatever the distribution happens to be, and the empirical distribution function, modified in this case because of censoring to use what are called the Kaplan-Meier positions on the cumulative distribution. It suggests this particular table that the log logistic distribution may actually be a little bit better than the log normal distribution. To see if that might be the case, I'm going to go to analysis options and now ask it to fit both. Fit both the log normal and log logistic distributions. Okay, you can see if I look at the goodness of fit tests that the p-value for the log logistic distribution is a little bit bigger than uh, for the log normal distribution. If you'd like to actually see the fit, over here is that histogram again, but this time I fit both the log logistic and the log normal distributions. You'll notice that the log logistic distribution puts a little bit more probability at low values of arsenic concentration, 
less than one, and the curve's a little bit lower um, above one. So um, it does imply a little bit different shape for the distribution. Mm -hmm. Now, <clears throat> we might also want to look at um, the quantile plot. What the quantile plot does is it plots the cumulative distribution of the data that is these individual points here. If you notice, those are the uncensored observations in the data. And the fitted cumulative distribution for both the log logistic and the log normal. Now, the Kolmogorov Smirnoff statistic is the maximum distance between the points and the curve. And you can see down here at around 0.9. The log logistic is a little bit closer to that point, which is probably why the Kolmogorov Smirnoff test likes it a little bit better. Uh, on the other hand, as I get up around here, it looks like the log normal distribution might be doing a little bit better job than the log logistic. When it all comes down to it, though, in this particular case, uh, I'm afraid that it's really impossible to decide for this small set of data whether the log logistic uh, or log normal distribution really is the most appropriate for this particular data. You know, they're, they're fairly close to one another. Um, so it's, it's probably not too critical which one I pick. And for this uh, small data, either one of those two distributions would do a reasonable um, job. Now, there is one other procedure that I could apply to this particular set of data, uh, also in version 17, and that is there's a procedure under describe life data life tables that will fit a non, will, will create non-parametric estimates of the cumulative distribution and survival function for a set of data. Now, <clears throat> this is has been around for quite a while. It's designed, though, to fit distributions, well, not to fit distributions, to obtain non-parametric uh, estimates for right censored data, okay? Solely right censored data. It was designed to handle basically survival data, uh, product reliability type applications, that sort of thing, okay? And as Helsel talks about in his book about environmental statistics, you can use these types of procedures, which have been around in statistical packages for many years, to handle left censored data like the arsenic data if you flip the data values. Okay, by flipping, well, well I'll, I'll show you what he means by flipping. Let me go back to stack graphics. Let's go to describe life data, life tables times. By flipping the data, what you do is you take something like value, those are the arsenic concentrations, but instead of analyzing them directly, you put in an expression like five minus value. That basically flips the data so that now, instead of being left censored, the values will be right censored. This, in fact, is what was necessary and still is in some statistical packages to handle left censored data. At the same time, I want to flip the censoring indicator. So I'll put in where it says censored, the expression censored equals minus one. That's a true or false statement. So if censored is equal to minus one, that'll be true and it'll flip the minus ones to one. Okay. 
Once you do that, you can then go ahead and estimate the non-parametric survival function. The non-parametric survival function uh, will look like this. It's done using what's called the Kaplan-Meier non-parametric, actually product uh, limit method for estimating survival without assuming any particular distribution. What you're seeing along the x-axis is 5 minus value. So actually 0 corresponds to the location here where it says 5. So you flip basically to small values. They've become large and large values have become small. Uh, also, the, this is the survival function for 5 minus value. So it's actually 1 minus the survival function for arsenic concentration. Now, turns out, and the reason we added the new procedure to version 18 is in version 18, I don't have to do this flipping. But if you still have version 17, you can do that flipping, and you can then get non-parametric estimates of the percentiles. Here is a percentile table. These are percentiles for 5 minus value. So if you take these numbers, subtract from 5, you get percentiles for arsenic concentration. So a non-parametric estimate of the 25th percentile for arsenic concentration is 5 minus 0.5, which is 0 0.5. The non-parametric median estimate, the 50th percentile is 0.7, and the 75th percentile is 0.9. Okay. Anyway, that's what had to be done. Um, before we wrote the new procedure for handling arbitrarily censored data. I just thought I'd show you that in case you have not yet updated to version uh, 18. Um, of course, that also doesn't solve the problem of fitting interval censored data, which we need to do for the second set of data I talked about, which is the breast cancer data. The second data set I want to look at, and this will use the new procedure, the new stack graphics procedure, is measurements on breast cancer patients who were given certain treatments, either radiation alone or radiation in chemotherapy. You can see for this particular data set that the column days is a censored numeric column. <laughs> some of the observations are right censored, some are left censored, and some are interval censored. There are actually two ways you could have entered this data. I could have used either this num censored numeric column where I directly typed in things like greater than 45, or bracket 6, 10 to indicate the censoring. An alternative procedure, though, that you could also use would be to set up two columns, a left column and a right column, indicating the allowable range for a particular observation. So, for example, if you look at patient 1, it says that there's a left bound on that observation at 45. That's as small as it could be. No upper bound. Patient 2 has a lower bound of 6, an upper bound of 10. Patient 3, which I entered as less than 7, actually has a lower bound of 0 and an upper bound of 7. Okay. Uh, it turns out our new procedure in stack graphics can handle either of these two formats. Now, in order to run this procedure, you'll need to go to the R interface option on the version 18 menu. 
Okay. And before you can run it, there are two R packages that need to be installed. You'll see down here on the installation configuration dialog box that it says if you want to do non-parametric analysis of arbitrarily censored data, you need to install the interval and iSense packages in R. And if you push that button, it'll take you through the procedure of installing those two particular packages. Well, I've already done that, so I'm not going to do that now. Since I already have those packages installed, I'm just going to go back to that R interface menu and select distribution fitting arbitrarily censored data. Now you can see that the first dialog box that comes up asks me what my data looks like. Is it a single column with censoring indicators like the days column? Or is it two columns with lower and upper limits like the left and right columns? I could have run either way, I would have gotten the same results. Since I have a single column, I'll just take that option and tell it that the data I want to analyze is in the column called days. I'm also going to restrict my analysis, in this case, to the patients that were given only radiation. So I'm going to type in the select field treatment equals quote RAD quote. And be a little bit careful Although variable names like treatment are not case sensitive, anything inside quotes is case sensitive. So you need to type RAD. Okay. The next dialog box is going to let me select from a set of distributions. And I'm going to go again with the log normal distribution. Log normal distribution is sort of our default distribution for data that has a lower bound of zero. Now, I could specify incidentally a different lower bound if I wanted to. You see down here uh, the lower threshold. Normally I will assume that the log normal distribution starts at zero although I could tell it something else for this breast cancer data. But zero sounds like a, a reasonable place to start. I'll tell it what the 95% or what the confidence level should be for any intervals it creates in the procedure, 95% being the default. I'll tell it whether or not I want to apply something called the Efron bias correction. Now this is a special correction that can be done for the non-parametric estimates of the survival function if the smallest observation in the data set is left censored. If the smallest observation in your data set is left censored, what the Efron bias correction does is assume that the survival equals one up to that particular smallest value. Otherwise, it makes an assumption that things changed linearly between zero and the smallest left censored observation. T technical point, uh, but uh, an option here. You also can specify here the number of bootstrap subsamples. Now, when we fit the distribution here, we will estimate parameters of the distribution, we will estimate percentiles of the distribution, and so forth. In order to get confidence limits for those distribution parameters and those percentiles, in the presence of all these different types of censoring, we're going to need to apply what's called bootstrapping. Bootstrapping is basically taking samples of your sample. 
if I do a bootstrap estimate, what I will do is I'll take a bunch of subsamples of my data, sampling my data with replacement, and determine just how much the percentiles or the means and standard deviations vary if I took different subsamples of the original data. So it's in, uh, sort of an important technique to apply when there's no good theoretical way to come up with estimates of confidence limits, for example, for percentiles. And you can imagine it would be very, very difficult to get a theoretical confidence interval for a percentile when you're fitting a log normal distribution with some left centering, some right centering, and some interval centering. So we allow the bootstrap procedure to sample the sample, look at the variability in those percentiles, and give me an idea about how accurate my estimates actually are. All right. Well, let's go ahead and do this. And when it comes to tables and graphs, I'll just take the defaults. Okay, now what it's doing is it's going in and fitting the distribution. And Stack Graphics does the actual maximum likelihood estimation of whatever distribution you select. The R interface is being used just to come up with a non-parametric estimate of the survival function. Well, let's take a look at this particular data. This is the breast cancer data. There were, in fact, no uncensored observations in this data set. There were three left censored, 18 interval censored, and 25 right censored observations. Okay. If we look at the scatter plot here, uh, what the scatter plot is showing us is for these 46 patients, what the possible values of breast retraction were, time until breast retraction. Uh, you can see that some of the observations, the ones whose intervals start at zero, were left centered. For example, patient three, uh, all we knew is it was less than seven, so there's an interval drawn between zero and seven. Uh, patient two was interval censored. The interval was six to 10. And patient one, I believe the observation was right censored at 45, so it could have been 45 or larger. You can quickly see in this particular uh, data set, there's quite a bit of right censoring going on most in most cases around 40, 45 days out. Uh, that was the last visit. Uh, although you do see some interval censoring and obviously some left censoring in the data as well. Okay, now let me come back uh, to PowerPoint for just a moment and talk about how we actually fit a distribution when we have this type of censored data. Okay, there we go. <clears throat> As I said, Stack Graphics is going to fit the distribution using maximum likelihood. And in the case of maximum likelihood, what you do is you numerically search for the distribution of parameters that give you the maximum value of this quantity called L. L is the product of the likelihood of each of the observations. Now, the likelihood itself, if the observation is not censored, is the probability density function at that particular observation. Okay? That's how we would handle distribution fitting in most cases where there was no censored data. On the other hand, if we have left censored observation, then L is defined as the cumulative distribution at the lower uh, at that at the lower limit of that observation. 
remember L sub I for less than seven, uh, L would be seven. So it's the probability of being less than that left column that I defined in the data set. If the observations are is right centered, it's one minus the cumulative distribution evaluated at the upper side, uh, the right-hand value of the interval. And if it's interval-centered, it's the difference between the cumulative distribution at the upper end of the interval and the lower end. It's a numerical problem that needs to be solved. Um, not too difficult for most of these distributions. And in fact, if I now go back to stack graphics and ask for distribution fitting, you can see the results of fitting a log normal distribution to this particular data set. Mm -hmm. The log normal distribution, as I talked about before on the arsenic data, is parameterized by a mean and a standard deviation. In this case, the estimated mean of that log normal distribution was 100.5, the standard deviation 214.7. It's also giving me estimates of the median, the lower quartile, the upper quartile, and the interquartile range. And calculating confidence intervals for all of those quantities based on a thousand bootstrap samples. So basically, it's taken subsamples, a thousand subsamples of my data, and looked at what happened 95% of the time to each of these particular quantities. Okay, so the median, for example, was 42.6. That was my estimate. 95% of my bootstrap samples had medians between 27 and 78. Okay, so that gives me an approximate 95% confidence interval for the median. Now, if you'd like to see it, uh, if I go over here and ask for the plot of the fitted distribution, you'll see what this particular distribution looks like. The log normal distribution, it turns out, well, we saw it for the arsenic data, uh, this is what it looks like for the breast retraction data. Starts at zero, goes up to a fairly uh, sharp peak in this case, and has quite a long tail. In this particular distribution, this particular data set, which, where there is a lot of right censoring, where all we know is that a lot of observations were bigger than 45, the fitted distribution actually has quite a significant long tail. In fact, rather than looking at the uh, fitted distribution, I might look, for example, at the cumulative distribution. That shows me the probability of being less than or equal to a particular value. And you see it crosses 0.5 at slightly less than 40, but by the time you get out to 100 days, it's only up around 75%. So there's quite a significant long tail to the distribution. Okay. And I might also go back and show you what the survival function is. For things like uh, this data set, the survival function is often more interesting than the cumulative distribution. The survival function shows me my estimate of the chance that, in this case, breast retraction will not have occurred by a particular number of days after uh, treatment. Uh, so you can see that by 100 days out, there's still about a 25% chance that retraction had not occurred. Okay. Now, one, one more comment uh, about this procedure, and then I'll stop for some questions. Uh, this particular procedure, this new version 18 procedure, um, which will handle left-censored, interval-censored, and right-censored data, 
uh, also can obtain inside this particular procedure non-parametric estimates of the survival function. That's the type of estimate where on the arsenic data, I flip the data. Well, actually, I could have taken that arsenic data directly to this procedure, and I would not have had to flip anything. It would just directly have given me the non-parametric estimate of the survival function. Basically, though, a, a non-parametric estimate is an estimate that you can obtain without assuming any particular distributional form. Now, it uses uh, the well-known methods of Kaplan and Meyer, who developed it first for uncensored data, and ac well, actually left and right censored data, and then Turnbull's modification to deal with interval censored data. Uh, it gives you a good comparison to, for example, the log normal distribution that I, that I fit to give me an idea of whether the log normal distribution has the right shape. The procedure, the non-parametric estimate, also calculates confidence limits. And this is where we go out to those R libraries to do the work for us. There are a couple of, of very good uh, libraries that were written in R that give us not only the non-parametric survival function, that part's fairly easy, but also confidence limits for the survival function. And that's the, uh, the difficult part. So let me, let me go back to the uh, stat graphics. And let me ask for non-parametric estimates. Here you can see what's called the Kaplan-Meyer-Turnbull estimate of, well, actually both the cumulative distribution function and the survival function. Okay, it's evaluated in a number of different positions in time. This is days after treatment. And as you'll see in just a moment, it turns out to be a step function. Uh, so it can only be evaluated at certain positions. Uh, it also gives you, though, 95% confidence limits for their survival function. In addition, you can see non-parametric estimates of the mean and standard deviation of the survival times. Now, to actually see the estimate, it's best if I go here to the survival function and ask to add the non-parametric estimates. The non-parametric estimates of the survival function look like a step function. It's a step function that changes at points where the data have been censored. And you can see that the estimated survival function goes down similar to a step function here. And it actually matches the log normal distribution quite nicely until around 45 days. Now, because of the fact, actually, that the maximum observation was interval censored at 48, the survival function, the Kaplan-Meier-Turnbull estimate, goes to zero at that point. Um, basically, we don't know much at all about the survival function non-parametric trickly past 45 days. And in fact, if I go back and ask for the non-parametric confidence limits, you'll see there are no confidence limits past the largest observation, which or the largest interval, which ended at 48 days. So non-parametrically, we really can't say much about what happens past 48 days. On the other hand, the log normal distribution, uh, we can extrapolate. Now, it certainly is an extrapolation, but you can see that it has matched the non-parametric estimates pretty nicely up until the point where we had no more data. Okay, so that's the version 18 uh, procedure. It works on arbitrarily censored data it can be left censored, it can be right censored, it can be interval censored. 
Oh, two two other quick graphs to show you. I also wanted to show you the box and whisker plot. This is a box and whisker plot for the Kaplan-Meier Turnbull estimate. This particular box and whisker plot actually shows me non-parametric percentiles. Based upon the KMT survival function, this is the first percentile. This is the 25th percentile. This is the mean. This is the 50th percentile. This is the 75th percentile. And if it could, they're estimated there'd be a whisker out to the 99th percentile. But because of the censoring of the data, um, it turns out the 99th percentile ends up at the exact same place as the 75th percentile. There simply is no good uh, way to estimate that percentile. And you can also see if I ask for the quantile quantile plot, the quantile quantile plot shows me the fitted quantiles for my log normal distribution. Okay, with the equivalent percentiles for the non-parametric estimate. That log normal distribution is doing a very, very good job where there is data, but then the non-parametric estimates really break down uh, because of all the right censoring at the high side. Okay, well, I went a little bit longer than an hour. I will, as I said, be posting the slides. There are quite a number of references that I've listed here. Uh, if you're interested in this sort of distribution fitting for interval sensor data, all the stat folios and the data files will be placed at www.statgraphics.com slash webinars. We'll try to get those up this afternoon. Um, you see here a description of the two R packages. Um, the interval package and the iSense package, which are our packages that we interface to. You see a couple uh, references by Helsel that have to do with non-detects, particularly for environmental data, and uh, Turnbull's uh, original article back in 1976 about how to do non-parametric estimates for uh, interval sensor data. All right, now let's see um, if there are some questions that have been asked, and it looks like there are a few. So uh, let me get in here and take a look at the questions. Um, okay, <clears throat> one is not a question, it's a suggestion. Uh, someone is interested in uh, uh, hearing webinars of, on some other topics. And she suggested some topics uh, for um, other webinars. Another question asks if there's a way to get the verbal portion of this in addition to the slides. Oh, yeah, I guess I didn't say that. In addition to posting the slides for you to look at, we post a full recording of the video on our website. So we have been recording this, and if you want to hear the vocal or watch the whole webinar again, or pass it on to your friends if there were, <laughs> if you thought it was worthwhile, uh, that will also be posted um, at stackgraphics.com/webinars. Uh, there's a question about whether the R interface is a new feature in Stack Graphics 18. The answer to that is yes. Yes, it was one of the things that we added to version 18, and it's allowed us to take advantage of certain libraries that, you know, well-known statisticians have written, um, for example, to do things like non-parametric estimates of survival for interval sensor data. And it's, it, although, um, Potentially, we could do that ourselves. It just allows us to do a lot more, more quickly by going out and um, interfacing to uh, 
libraries, which involved quite a bit of work uh, in order to do certain types of calculations. All right, uh, and that is, yes, uh, part of version 18. Someone asked about predicting more than one variable at the same time. Okay, that is not something that uh, we have added to Stack Graphics at the at the moment. Um, um, right now, if you wanted to do predictions for more than one variable, you'd have to run separate procedures for each of the variables. Um, we've also not y added yet the ability to test whether there's a significant difference between two non-parametric survival functions. Uh, that's something that uh, we're going to be adding. Uh, in this particular data set, incidentally, there were two uh, samples. There was a sample of folks that had been given uh, radiation and a sample of folks that were given radiation and chemotherapy. And we could right now go as far as running two procedures, one for each, and overlaying the two survival curves on top of each other. Um, but we have not yet added a statistical way to say yes or no to whether there's a significant difference between those two groups. Okay, that's something we will be adding. Um, but, you know, <clears throat> you'll have to wait for the next version. Uh, to get that particular test. All right, I don't see any other questions. So unless uh, I see something in the next five seconds or so, I wanna thank you all for attending. Oh, one question just did pop up. Uh, someone would like to know more about how to determine sample size. That's interesting. I will have to look into that and uh, maybe we'll be able to, uh, in a future version, get put in something for um, sample size. Um, okay, someone asks also where they go for the R interface. The R interface, um, the ability to interface stack graphics to R comes with version 18. Um, the version 18 menu will assist you in installing and, and setting up R. That is something though you need to do by downloading R, which is a free application uh, from the internet. And we do have documentation of how to do that if you haven't yet uh, done that. Okay, well, thank you all for attending. I uh, hope to see you at the next webinar, which will be a little bit later in the spring. So long.